webinar presentation. We'll be getting going very shortly here. My name is uh, John Stonier. I'm going to be the moderator tonight uh, for this presentation. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, uh, our speaker tonight. Uh, I believe this is one of the early, if not the first uh, presentation of its kind uh, in this new regulations that have just come into place uh, on January the 1st of this year. Um, so a couple things to say just before we get started. <clears throat> Uh, I think that's all I want to say. Oh, um, Viva has a web page that we've dedicated to this uh, presentation, and we have started to put some uh, information where reference information. So if you go to our website, there's a link from uh, one of the first the slider pictures on the on our homepage that'll link you to the uh, low carbon fuel standard page that we've set up, and. Um, and we will be uh, posting the presentation after this after this presentation is completed tonight. So I guess without ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker. Uh, Michael Rensing joined the British Columbia Public Service in September 2003 to work in the air protection security of the Ministry of Environment. In November 2007, that was the energy year for the energy plan of the former government, he moved to the Ministry of Energy Mines to develop policies and legislation for renewable and low carbon fuels. Currently, he is the director of the low carbon fuels branch and is the 2021 recipient of the BC Bioenergy Sector Champion Award for outstanding leadership and contribution to the bioenergy sector in British Columbia. Michael has a PhD in physics from the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And with that, I'd like to welcome Michael to our presentation tonight. Thank you, John. Um, pleasure to be here virtually. It still seems after two years to be odd to be doing this from my own office and then speaking to an audience that I can't see. But um, I'm happy to be here and uh, I'll start my presentation and in a second. And uh, first thing is that I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking to you all from the traditional territory of the Sankeys and Esquimalt people whose interconnected relationship with all aspects of life continues with the land to this day. Um, I'm going to speak about the, um, I was asked to speak about the opportunities, particularly for stratas to, um, oh, wait a minute, I did what I wasn't supposed to do, which is start my full screen before sharing. Um, it's going to speak about the opportunity for Stratus to report the supply of electricity under the low carbon fuel standard, um, because this creates a, a mechanism that should help Stratus um, pay the costs. And um, we've got some numbers, uh, some details worked out that should help with all of that. I won't go too much into the low carbon fuel standard because if I start, we'll still be here in March. Um, it's a very complex piece of legislation. It has some simple outcomes, but the, uh, the overall concept or, or uh, policy is that it's intended to enable low carbon transportation solutions and a, transport and a transition to the adoption and use of sustainable low carbon energy. Um, so we call it the low carbon fuel standard now. There's, there's a similar standard in California. There's a clean fuel standard, which is the same structure as California in Oregon. Washington is developing one. And we've had ours in place in BC since 2010. We were, we were the first in step with California. Um, but if you're looking for it as a piece of uh, legislation in British Columbia, it's called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction, Renewable and Low Carbon Fuel Requirements Act. It was one of a suite of acts that was brought in under the Gordon Campbell government. Um, we all call them the Greenhouse Gas Brackets Act. Um, this is one of the last with this name, um, and it will be gone next year because we're going to replace it with a Low Carbon Fuels Act that has the same impact, um, same effect, fixes regulatory loopholes and administrative issues. The reg is called the Renewable Low Carbon Fuel Requirements Regulation. It's the only one under the Act. You can find it online at uh, bclaws.ca. 
just realized that I'm pointing without there. Now I have a pointer. So bclaws.ca and general information about the, um, the administration and the details of the act is available online at gov.bc.ca slash low carbon fuels. Um, so because of the structure of the, of the act, we have a term that's in use right now talking about part three fuels. Part three of fuels are the fuels described under part three of the act. That's the name, the reason for the name. And uh, they are the uh, pool of fuels that are subject to the low carbon requirements, the requirements that we see a decrease in carbon intensity of energy that is supplied for transportation use. Uh, the, the two classes that are in place right now are the gasoline class and the diesel class. Anything that can be blended with those fuels counts. Anything that can replace those fuels counts. So um, we see biodiesel, we see renewable diesel, we see natural gas, propane, electricity, and hydrogen, all displacing both gasoline and diesel. And um, we have had for a while a difficulty with these other fuels, the, the ones that are not gasoline, diesel, and the, and the blends, in that natural gas and electricity in particular are so widely used that we can't, we don't want to regulate all uses. We only want to regulate the use or credit the use when it is used in displacement of transportation fuel. And when I say that, I, I say that from the perspective of 2008, when we, 2007, 2008, when we started this policy, every major transportation fuel in this province was pure fossil-based gasoline, pure fossil-based diesel, and a bunch of other stuff. You know, we've had a long history of electric vehicles, propane, even natural gas, but the population of vehicles was really small in, in 2008. And the goal was to increase all of those and the sustainable replacements for fossil fuels. Um, in order for us to regulate as a replacement for gasoline, we had to make some changes to the regulations and that's what came into effect on January 1st. We've now clarified that electricity is considered to be supplied when it has been provided through a charging station or other equipment that we have named final supply equipment. So for TransLink, for example, final supply equipment is the connection to the rails of the, of the SkyTrain or for the electric trolley bus, it's the overhead cables. Um, the reporting requirements are now such that there are a few uh, grandfathered applications that the utility continues and will continue to report. Um, I'm going to start from the bottom of the list. So electric trolley buses for routes that were already in operation in De on December 31st of 2020. SkyTrain routes that were in operation on December 31st, 2020. If TransLink puts in new routes, the SkyTrain expansions, all of those, it'll be TransLink that'll be reporting those. As we move to uh, battery electric buses, it will be the transit operators that report that electricity. And you'll see from the value of the electricity, this is a significant credit value. It should help them in, you know, help them to be incented to um, increase the electric. Uh, the use of electricity in transit, increase our transit opportunities, um, and help off that set the cost of installing and maintaining those as opposed to cheap internal combustion engines. Um, we also have, uh, government has decided that uh, residential charging, as it was described to me, uh, would remain uh, to the credit that to, to be claimed by the utilities as the uh, the body that would have the ability to maximize the number of credits reported and to um, deal with the costs of improving our infrastructure because of the demand created by increasing use of electric vehicles without having to impact rates unnecessarily. 
Um, and uh, I had to sit down for a while, consultation work and so on. And we came to the decision that a residential application would be for any building that has fewer than five dwelling units. So uh, 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 the, the main target of that is, you know, so many uh, single family dwellings actually contain basement suites, so they contain two dwelling units. Um, and if you move into, or if you look into areas where uh, real estate is expensive and, and uh, um, rental housing is, is sparse, you'll find three, four, five suites in a building. So the cutoff, four suites and less, the utility will estimate the electricity supply to uh, vehicles based on a statistical method that we're working on with them. Anything above that then falls into the, uh, the territory of a strata or other organization, a rental, a larger operation. And when we moved into that territory, the desire was to make sure that the credits were going to the party who's doing the work to get the electricity supplied. And we've structured it in such a way that we that we anticipate this should work well for um, for strata councils, and you'll see the the economic value in this. What we're hoping then is it provides um, you could call it a subsidy, but the money comes from the sale of the credit. It's not taxpayer money, um, but it, that it will help with the costs of installing and operating uh, chargers in. Uh, parquet garages, strata uh, council garages, and so on, um, in such a way that the strata council and the tenants of the building don't actually have to uh, pay for those improvements unless they're really motivated. Um, so the question at, at up till January was who gets to report? And we had some ambiguities that constantly led us to the conclusion that there were always at least two people who could claim the right to report. And one of them was usually a utility, which means they always win every argument. They're the big guys in the room. Um, what we've got now boils down to this decision tree that we put together as we were working out this policy. So first question to ask is, is the electricity provided through the final supply equipment? And if we're talking about electric battery vehicles, we're talking about the chargers. Is it metered? Or can the quantity be estimated to reasonable accuracy, like 95% accuracy? And obviously, if you can't measure it, you can't report it. So if it can't be measured, no one reports. Yes, it can be measured. It's electricity. It's not that hard. So then the next question is, who reports it? Does the equipment service a residential building that has fewer than five dwelling units? Well, if that's yes, then the utility reports. Bigger buildings, the answer is no, you go down. Does it serve as TransLink? Because we're asking a very general question. TransLink, tethered or fixed guideway, that, that's a uh, bureaucratic code for uh, trolleys or rails. If the answer is yes, was the uh, route in operation before January 1st? If that's the case, utility reports. If not, the transit operator reports. That's what I was just talking about. And so if you get off to the bottom of this, uh, it can be measured. It's not being reported by anyone else. Then it is the person who provides the electricity through the final supply equipment who reports. That means that in the case of public chargers, it's whoever provides the electricity through the public charger. So when you see a public charger that is BC Hydro branded, yes, that's BC Hydro. But um, over time, we're going to be seeing more the flow chargers that would be reported by flow or whoever is providing the electricity under the agreement with flow or charge point. Hi, Susie. Um, other, other folks that are in that business, the Utilities Commission a couple of summers ago determined that there was a competitive opportunity for the supply, a commercial supply of electricity for electric vehicles in a public situation and there was no need for regulation beyond the, the regulations needed for safety. And um, this supports that. If there's private enterprise bringing these electric chargers into the market, they will be the ones who are in, uh, required, actually entitled to report the electricity and claim the credits. And then in the situations like a fleet operation, a multi-unit residential building, a strata corporation uh, situation, 
Um, it would be whoever provides the electricity and provides would be, uh, you know, owns it in a way when it goes through the charger. So who's paying the electricity bill for it? Um, it's not necessarily it's not necessarily the person with the vehicle unless that is a um, one to one um, relationship and it's in a public or uh, multi residential kind of circumstance. Um, so uh, <laughs> so how does the uh, how does the reg work itself? So let's just assume you're now looking at this because you think you're probably subject to the regulation. What's going on? So the way the the regulation works for low carbon fuels, we set carbon intensity limits through cabinet regulations that prescribe a reduction relative to the baseline fuel, the fossil fuel. And uh, for 2022, I believe we're at about an 11% reduction from baseline. And our current target is 20% by 2030. Clean BC says we're going to look seriously at changing that schedule and get try and get to 30% by 2030. Um, and that means that as these targets went down, the gap between the baseline fossil fuels started getting larger. And the low carbon fuels, the very low carbon products uh, like clean electricity and renewable fuels um, are below that line by a fair amount. And if you're above the target, you generate a debit. And if you're below the target, you generate a credit. And if you are not supplying liquid fuels, you're in electricity, it's, all, it's always going to be a credit because it is so far below the carbon intensity target that you're not going to have to think about its carbon intensity in terms of compliance debits, unless we're looking at a target of a 90 to 95% reduction. Um, the credit calculation, which is where you'll eventually get to the number of credits and the and the dollar value. This is section six of the act. Um, what we've got here is you get either a credit or a debit out of this calculation, depends on whether the number is positive or negative. The prescribed limit for the class is the CI class limit, carbon intensity class limit. There's an efficiency ratio that I bet many people on this call are aware of. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and there's a multiplicative product here, and then subtract the carbon intensity of the fuel. So here's the difference between the target and the fuel. And then multiply by the energy content. So you get, um, what do we get here? We get uh, megajoules uh, or uh, thousand tons per liter or, or per megajoule, I mean, and then uh, divide by a million and you're down to grams per megajoule. Um, this EER, we call it the energy effectiveness ratio because it's not really fuel efficiency, but it is the efficiency of a particular means of converting your energy into transportation. And an electric motor is two and a half, three times more efficient in taking a megajoule of energy and rolling a vehicle down the road than an internal combustion engine is. Diesel engine is 20% better than a gasoline engine. We bring that factor in here because what that does then is say, well, there's the target, but your fuel could be better than that. And we want to measure everybody on the same equivalence. In California, they call it gasoline gallon equivalence. And so they bring all the different sources of energy into equivalence with one gallon of gasoline through their EER factor. It's the same, in fact, they're identical numbers with our regulation from California's numbers from 2010, because we adopted the same set of informa input information. California's updated since then. We're going to be doing an update in January. Um, carbon intensity of the fuel, energy content, and you then end up with your credit or debit. What does that look like for electricity? Um, if we take the typical consumption of a vehicle, the, the 2,000, 2,500 kilowatt hours per year of an electric vehicle in use in BC, um, eight to 10 vehicles generates, and let's make a round number, 20,000 kilowatt hours. Um, the carbon intensity class for gasoline class fuel, 
this is this is a worked example that you'll all be able to refer to when you get a copy of the presentation. Um, is for 2022 78.20 grams per uh, grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per megajoule. The energy efficiency ratio that is prescribed in the reg right now for electricity in the gasoline class is 3.4. The carbon intensity of electricity in British Columbia, our clean BC hydroelectricity is still got a carbon intensity because we look at the full life cycle. So it's 19.73 grams according to the model we use. People say, how does hydroelectricity have a carbon footprint? Think about all those reservoirs and all the leaves falling on them in the fall and the um, anaerobic decay on the bottom of the lake, the flooding of the, of the river valleys where all the stumps were left behind in the Arrow Lakes, uh, what's going to be happening in the piece. There is always a turnover of carbon in the ecology of a lake. And because you flooded that river valley and made the lake, your operation to generate electricity is accountable for that. This is as good as that we can expect to get as long as we're even using hydroelectricity. Um, energy density, 3.6 megajoules per kilowatt hour, basic physics. The energy content then is the energy density, the 3.6 times the 20,000 kilowatt hours, 72,000 megajoules. The credit or debit calculation that was on that previous slide then, the target, times the EER minus the carbon intensity of the fuel times the energy content and you end up with 17, 18 credits for 20,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. We don't issue fractions of a credit right now, but we will be not rounding off the numbers to whole credits um, in, the, in the future because we now have this electricity and as you can see, eight to 10 vehicles in a year generating 18 credits kind of matters if you round up or round down. And so we're probably going to leave a few decimal points on this. So we would call this in the future 17.72. The credit price and the credit market is information is available on our website. The credit price right now has hit as high as $465 a unit. If the market improves, the suppliers find other ways to comply, you expect to see the price go down, but the trend is upward right now. So that 20,000 kilowatt hours leads to about $8,370 worth of credit in a year. Um, John asked me the other day about validating a calculation. If I recall correctly, it was 42 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, for 10 years, I've been telling our stakeholders electricity could be given away for free and you could make a profit. And um, I think there's a few folks on the call who understand that, but we haven't seen anybody leap into competition with BC Hydro because we had to bring this clarity into the situation to, uh, to provide enough confidence that uh, people would uh, invest in creating charger networks and not lose the, um, the opportunity to a um, single utility. Um, some practical details about claiming your credits, reporting. Um, it is a requirement to report if you are generating electricity. We are making some adjustments in the act where it is going to be um, non-mandatory when we get to small amounts because we don't really um, want to force anybody to report um, you know, a half a credit unless you really want to, but we also have an, a limit to our administrative capacity. Um, we're looking to see aggregation in the, in the behavior and so on. And anybody who's running a strata or whatever, uh, whatever business arrangements you arrive at um, should be able to access the value of those credits. Our compliance period, the year that we talk about when we say has to be compliant in the year is the calendar year, January 1st to December 31st. Everybody has until March 31st to file a compliance report. So two things happen in that time period. Um, all of the oil companies in particular get their books in order, just like we get our taxes in order. And they file a report on March 31st. If they're in a penalty situation, they also remit their penalty. Um, but in that period between January 1st and March 31st, 
Everybody who needs credits tries to scramble and get hold of them if they're short. And so that's one of the reasons we see a fair bit of trading in the final uh, quarter of the financial year, the first quarter of the calendar year, because that's the period in which the credits can move around to get to the companies who need them. Um, and the goal then is at the end of the compliance period, you have a balance of zero or more credits to avoid non-compliance. The balance of zero implies that the products, all of the products you sold averaged out to the same carbon intensity as the target for that year. Um, a balance greater than zero means you were, you were better than that and you didn't sell all your credits off, right? Um, so you can hang on to those credits for use in later years. Not much benefit if you don't have debits, but the companies that have debits are um, well aware of the value of having, uh, having a bit of a cushion from um, year to year and being able to stay ahead of things. Um, and uh, they can be traded freely. We are the ones that control the market, but we control it mostly by registering trades and being the only place in which, the only market in which a trade can happen. Um, and those who are going to sell credits have to have them validated before they can trade. And the reason for that is whoever buys them gets a guarantee from government that the credit won't go away if there's some kind of an adjustment. And so if, uh, if an electric uh, charger operator reports to us and claims too many credits, we do an audit, we will adjust the charging company's balance, not the person who bought their credits, right? We charge, and uh, I shouldn't say charge, we adjust the balance. Um, and so that at the end of the year, if you're in compliance, fine, it was just an adjustment. If you're out of compliance, you have to pay a penalty. And uh, we do all of this inside of our electronic reporting system. We call it TFERS familiarly. It's just Transportation Fuels Reporting System. Um, it shows everybody's standing, credit balance, history of past transactions. It's used for transfers of credits. And uh, the market was that in 2021, we had 85 transfers and the value was over $245 million. Um, only about 10 to 15 percent of all credits generated trade. Most of the suppliers can generate most of their compliance. It still leaves a demand for a large number of credits from the perspective of the market price right now. Um, the way you report, you would sign up for an account. And the first thing required, uh, we have information on our website page and I'll, I'll show you the link again, but you must have a business BCEID. Um, the government has this um, service that uh, takes care of guaranteeing identity and um, protecting identification. Um, we're looking for the business version of that, not the personal one. We've done a bit of work in the last couple of months to make sure that the BCID department is aware that strata corporations might be registering for access. Uh, apparently, there isn't a strata corporation category. You select other as your business type and then wait for an analyst to follow up to complete the process. Basically, it's making sure that your corporation, your organization is who you say they are, because you're then in our system able to trade credits and uh, participate in the scheme of the act. Um, the other thing for electric vehicle charging is that we require the final supply equipment to be registered. And there's a uh, registration form online. We are hoping to make it electronic, but it's gonna take us a couple of years to get the software um, advanced to that point. We do require um, coordinates of the location, uh, latitude and longitude, GPS. What we're doing is making sure that nobody else is reporting the same information from the same chargers or even different information, but claiming the same charger. Uh, we're also making sure that if there's a um, question about who should be reporting, that we're able to identify exactly which charger is in question as we try to resolve the rest of the, of the issues. The registration then says, okay, 
first person who's in is considered to be the owner if we've seen adequate ID. But if somebody else comes along, we now know who to talk to to resolve the, the um, disagreement, the misunderstanding. And um, in order to make life easy in the current, it's not going to make it all that easy, but in the current act or the current regulation, um, a, a corporation could appoint uh, or, or uh, hire an agent to act on behalf. The agent would still have to represent each individual group. Um, we weren't able to make it possible to sign over all accountability to someone else who can take it on for you and just send you a monthly check for the for your share of the revenues. But that is coming uh, in the next act. And our schedule right now is to bring that into effect January 1st, 2023. So 11 and a half months from now. Um, and of course, if somebody's going to represent you, we want to be sure that they're legally um, authorized to do so. So we have an, a representation agreement form um, on our web page that can be filled out and informed uh, uh, that can be used to inform us. Um, there's probably going to be a whole slew of questions. If they are specific around your particular circumstance, one of the best ways to resolve them would be to contact us at this email address, lcfs at gov.bc.ca and uh, explain your question in an email. And one of my staff will actually look at your specific circumstances and get in touch to answer your specific questions. Um, our goal would then be to have everybody who wants to be in our system as a valid generator of credits registered in our system, able to access it. Um, we publish our credit market reports monthly um, and quarterly. Monthly, it's the data for the past month. Quarterly, it provides more summary. The quarterly report includes some charts. Uh, we have number of credit transfers, volumes, credit prices, um, and uh, the number of credits and debits incurred. There is an information bulletin. Uh, there is a series of information bulletins. Number 13 on the website includes contacts for fuel suppliers. If you're looking to sell your credits, the way to identify a possible client is to think about who sells fossil fuels. They're going to buy your credit and pay for your work. Um, they are the ones that are the recognizable names, you know, Parklands and Shell and Imperial Oil and so on. And there's a contact, a piece of contact information in this bulletin. It's an email address without the ampersand so that you, that they can't scrape it for spam. But um, I'm not sure how well received uh, somebody trying to sell a couple of credits would be. But this is another reason for aggregators. We've got um, at least one agent who represents five or six companies that are on that sheet. You can, you can find out who that is by some deductive logic. He's able to pull together groups of credits and bundle deals that get good prices. Um, and yeah, so if you have questions, um, I'll try and answer the general ones now. Um, it was, was it Don that was going to keep track of the incoming questions and uh, feed them to me and we can work with that. Um, and then if they are specific or we haven't answered all your questions, we will be conducting um, official sort of stakeholder information sessions. Um, this one, this evening came about because uh, Viva contacted me and said, would I, would I speak to this issue? Many people are, have questions and concerns. We've also been hearing from various strata corporation organizations and, and uh, individual you know, building management firms and so on. Some of you may be on the call, but others um, have contacted us in the past. We will keep doing information sessions until everybody's had a chance to hear what needs to be heard. We will also continue to put um, increasing amounts of information online. And the email is, uh, address is there to answer questions. If it's complex and tricky, we might have to deal with some policy questions, but if it's about registration and so on, um, when you hear back, you'll, you'll, um, you will get a solution to getting online and, and reporting. Um, so that, uh, yeah, that, summarizes that that concludes what I was uh, was going to present it's kind of a whirlwind tour of 
some very practical stuff um, and uh, happy to answer questions that I can or, um, you know, make note and, uh, and invite you to contact us for a more formal response. But uh, we're just getting this sort of up and running as a, um, as a system right now. By next year, it should be fairly solid in that um, we can deal with uh, kind of an unlimited number of chargers, if you will, um, where the um, owners of those chargers in a strata could just commission a company who would provide aggregation services and have a contract saying, if we're, if we're keeping your chargers up and running and monitoring your data and reporting your credits and selling them, here's your share of the profits and here's our share of the profits. Um, and all of that is left up to the open market. So Don, questions? Yes. Okay, yes, I have some questions. Um... Michael, and I'll just say that a, a number of the questions here deal with uh, the technical aspects of how to meter and what is a reliable meter and, and uh, yeah. different electricity sources. So I'm going to ask a number of these kind of as a group, but one at a time. Yeah. So the first one comes from Donovan Whistler. Uh, will these carbon credits apply to a strata or public charging situation, irregardless of where the electricity is supplied? That is, uh, if it's BC hydroelectricity in one instance and in another where electricity is generated under the BC hydro net metering program. And then he has a follow up saying he's talking about like if he was generating solar, which I know Donovan yeah. does generate solar, would that make a difference uh, where the electricity comes from? Um, from our perspective, it would not. Our view is that the person who supplies the electricity, and that would be kind of a natural meaning of the word. So do you own the electricity when it goes through the charger? Um, and that means if you bought it from BC Hydro, um, you own it through the charger, you're the supplier. If you generated it yourself, like a solar array or some other uh, local production, you need to think about the fact that supplying electricity in a public context makes you a utility subject to the Utilities Commission. We stay out of that part, right? So you might trigger a whole bunch of other regulations, but we are um, only interested in that act of supply and identifying a person, a, a, a person in the legal sense where it could be a corporation that is responsible for that supply and can report it to us. And then the, the situation like the residential versus uh, open charging. Hydro might be a supplier in a public context, but they're a supplier like anyone else. They don't have any special rights in the public context. It's only with those cases I mentioned, SkyTrain, trolley buses, and residences containing fewer than four dwellings. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna put these two questions together. They're about different aspects of the supply of electricity. Jim Heinsen has asked, if a Stratus EVSE are connected to a separate hydrometer that supplies electricity for EVs only, can the readings from the EV revenue grade meter be used to apply for carbon credits instead of reporting the individual kilowatts of each EVSE? Uh, we prefer the summary reports. And so absolutely, yes, that's probably one of the better situations. And if I were, um, if I were installing a, uh, uh, you know, charging network in a garage of a strata, that's exactly what I would do. I would put a, a, a meter in, separate that from the rest of the supply. It is the only electricity and somebody complains about giving it away for free. It's not fair to the residences. You can set up the business case at 42 cents a kilowatt versus uh, worth of credit that says actually the strata is putting in better parking or whatever you do with the money in the strata, but it's a revenue source, not a drain. Um, and um, aggregation that way is is just fine with us. We only want the grand totals. The, the gory details are subject to audit. And we don't really want to have to audit an individual uh, company. This is where we're looking for that aggregation where, uh, where a charge point or a, a, a flow would come in and provide the service, report to us, and, and we'd hear about 100 stratas at once. Um, that would be great. 
Um, there was an implied question in a couple of things, and it, uh, one of the questions caught my eye too. For the low carbon fuel standard, we are not requiring commercial grade metering, and we are not requiring meters certified for commerce. We want good answers that are reasonable and accurate, but we've got room for some leeway. We, we have to be aware that eventually we might have to deal with some fraud or some, uh, some cheating, but we're going to start on the, on the assumption that there's enough ability to scrutinize and, and data because this is all the electronic world. And um, uh, there are very few chargers going into the market. And my colleague is, the, uh, is Christine Anicello, responsible for the zero emission vehicle programs. My understanding is very few chargers are going into it, being installed these days that don't have the ability to report back through a wireless connection about the amount of electricity flowing through. That might not be acceptable to Weights and Measures Canada for sale of the electricity. It might not work for the Utilities Commission, but it's fine for us so far. Okay, and the next question about supply uh, comes from Mohad Mohammed Akladji. I'm sorry if I butchered your name, Mohammed. Uh, can the hundreds, soon to be thousands of measured level one chargers in BC MERBs also benefit from this policy or is the policy biased towards level two charging? There is no consideration of the quality of the charger, the level. The question is, can you measure it? And so um, all of it can be reported uh, okay. as long as there is a satisfactory degree of accuracy to the, to the measuring. Okay, uh, Kelly Carmichael asks, uh, I feel that builders will attempt to retain ownership of the Merb Parkade and will cost EV drivers significant additional money to get access to EV chargers and electricity. Is there anything that can be done to prevent excessive costs in this scenario? Um, that's a tough one for me to answer, particularly as a, as a government employee who doesn't work in that area, but I would say that knowledge is power. And um, if you are aware of the value of that, you are in a position to negotiate. And I would assume that it's the strata or the building owners. If it's a rental situation, uh, that's something else again. But it is early days for a comprehensive understanding of all of these implications for utilities commission and, and uh um, whatever bodies govern rentals and, and uh, short-term um, commercial arrangements for housing and so on. So I, I think that this is going to have to evolve. It won't necessarily evolve under our um, governance because we're not responsible for those aspects. We're interested and, and authorized only to deal with the accounting of the energy. Okay, thank you. Um, Lawrence Garwin asks, at $1,000 per vehicle per year, which is approximately what your yeah. example gave that uh, you, know, uh, you generate about $1,000 per car with these credits uh, at the current rates, why not allow electric meters with fewer than five units to get credits for charging EVs? How are these meter holders less worthy or responsible I'm one of those, by the way, who has my own home uh, meter. Yes. Uh, than those with a meter for more than five units. So, I am going to sidestep that because it is inherent in the um, governance of BC Hydro, the the costs associated with providing service and the rates we all pay. And uh, the one one thing I can I'm willing to say, um, the val the revenue from these credits in the past has been factored in and has at least a half to 1% impact on our rates throughout BC. So that's part of the picture there. Cabinet is very concerned about that interaction between these credits and the electrification, the cost of vehicle incentives and charger incentives, and the cost of increasing and improving our electricity infrastructure to meet the demand for electric vehicles that policy is driving us towards. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stuart Forsyth asks, what is planned for farm equipment reporting EV tractors and other things that are coming online? 
Excellent question. Um, we have taken a very generous um, view on the meaning of transportation. And uh, to, to summarize my, uh, my mentor's uh, analysis from 12 years ago, does it move? It's a tractor, yes it does. Okay, it's transportation. So put in a charger and you will be able to report those credits. Now, interesting question. You'd want, you'd want to make sure you're clear. This is a farm application, not a residential application. But I don't think it would be too hard to make that argument. And, uh, you know, if there's a problem with it, we deal with it when that surfaces. But I would say that if somebody's got an electric tractor, um, definitely report it. And, and let us know because we'd love to be able to highlight that and let people know that these are becoming real. Would you need five tractors or five tractor chargers or five fields or what? Good question. How much <laughs> diesel does a farm need every year? I think it's probably as much or more as a traveling salesman. So probably a good, uh, you know, equivalent of three to five to 10 vehicles. Just a guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, Barbara McLean has asked a very broad question, uh, which is how does this scheme help us meet our carbon reduction goals? We need more low carbon fuels. Um, and with all respect to people who are very enthusiastic about electric vehicles, we need a wide range of sustainable sources of energy. Electricity is the one that's right in front of us and is very widely available. But we've also seen the, um, you know, the analyses that say we need three more site C's to replace all the gasoline. We use 8 billion liters of fuel right now. The number is starting to come down. I think it's probably not just COVID. Um, but this whole scheme is allowing the economy to make a transition without causing huge disruption. Um, did anybody notice the problems last December with the flooding, he asked rhetorically. <laughs> um, we are, no matter whether you like it or not, we are heavily dependent on liquid fuels. And what this regulation is doing is it's providing an, uh, an economic support to moving towards electrification and other alternatives to liquid fuels. It's decreasing our demand for liquid fuels. Hopefully we cut it well beyond half. And then we're able to replace the remaining needed liquid fuels for those specialty applications, like the excavators that had to get helicoptered in on, uh, on uh, Coquihalla with sustainable renewable fuels that can compete in environmental footprint with electricity. But we have to get diversity into our supply. And this mechanism is about doing that. So it's the fossil fuel companies that are going to buy these credits. So um, what you're enabling when you sell a credit to them is you're enabling them to get into compliance at the same time as you're generating credits because they enabled you to install chargers and buy cars and whatever other um, economic help that provided. And over time, as the targets come down, we'll see demand destruction in gasoline, then eventually demand destruction in diesel, and we'll see us converting. So um, those who don't know, a little pitch for the liquid fuel side, Parkland Refinery in Burnaby has been co-processing. They are bringing in um, sustainable vegetable oil and mixing it with their crude oil and the, and the fossil, what used to be the fossil product they make in the refinery is now five to 10-ish percent renewable content. Um, they can make a greater transformation as that vegetable oil becomes more available without ruining its sustainability. And the only reason that they're doing this kind of thing is because of a regulation like the low carbon fuel standard that puts it all in a big pot and gives them time to make choices and adjustments. Long-winded answer. I hope it actually partly answered the question. Okay, very good. Um, okay, here's two questions that I'm gonna to roll together about sure. uh, if you're in a townhouse and this the electricity may be individually metered. So I'm gonna read Wendy Wall's a question. It makes sense to me that a strata ID, the FSE, when the electricity is being supplied from common electricity and apply for credits. 
But what if the charges run from each owner's panel, like five or more townhouses? In that case, the FSE is an individual person and who can yeah. apply for the credits or can they apply for the credits? Um, anybody can apply. The question will be whether we say yes or no. And yeah. the, the problem becomes a little convoluted because it involves BC Hydro. And um, I think that we would have to get a bit legal on this. This would be the kind of question that we need. We would need a specific case. We would need it detailed and we'd go to our legal counsel. We'd talk to Hydro. But if that if that is a strata property where the strata is structured that individuals pay um, their own bills, I think that would tend to fall into the, I'm just speculating. I don't wanna say this is a legal opinion. It better to ask us formally and work it through. But I think that means that essentially you are, you are a single family residence, not a multi-unit. And I, I actually, first house I owned had a strata simply so that we could have a common sewer system. Everything else was independent. That probably has to fall within, uh, it's a residential with, high, with the utility uh, reporting. Is there a common parking area? You know, is there a, is there a common uh, charger that everybody uses that the strata is paying for starts to resolve those questions. So no easy answer there um, because it's a tough territory to uh, identify unless you're talking specific cases. So, sounds like each individual uh, place might want to send a email to your yeah, site and, there and, and more ask, that ask the specifics. The <laughs> longer it's going to take us, but um, it's uh, yeah, we, we'll have to see how it all plays out. I have a feeling some of my staff are going to learn more about real estate ownership <laughs> titles than we ever thought we would, but we have to dig into the details to, to answer questions like that accurately. Okay, Steve Young has asked a fairly uh, technical question, so I'm just gonna completely read it. Uh, Do you envisage changes to the BC LCFC market with the introduction of the federal clean fuel standard, either in the cost of credits or the interchangeability of credits between the two systems? Will it be possible nor necessary to claim both BC and federal fuel credits for the same infrastructure? Right. Um, so of course the details, the feds are going to have to answer. The BC low carbon fuel standard and the federal clean fit fuel standard are going to coexist. And so that means that both apply in BC, that uh, an act of supply has to be if required to be reported, has to be reported under both. So if it's something you have to report in BC, you have to report in BC. If that same activity is reportable federally, you have to report it there. Um, wait and see for Gazette 2 and the formal regulations federally to know how much credit is going to come from electric vehicles. I've been involved in their development process. Um, somebody else asks, I see at the top of my list, has a ministry consulted with ECCC. Um, just, just to brag a little, it's the other way around. ECCC started the clean fuel standard because of the work we have done in BC. And in fact, the very first policy suggestion originated with myself and my mentor who were, uh, who were coming up with, well, what can BC recommend? So we recommended a low carbon fuel standard. They morphed it into the clean fuel standard. Um, the credits won't be interchangeable, but if an activity generates credits under both regs, then you'll get two kinds of credits. You'll get a federal one and a provincial one. You sell the federal one in the federal market, you sell the provincial one in the provincial market. But it's not absolutely clear under what circumstances electric vehicles will be getting credits. And I think the federal rules have more to do with the vehicle than the charger, um, but I'm, I'm lost track of that because it has been an evolving situation over the last year. Okay, um, now this next question from Bob Porter has to do with uh, the carbon credits you put to um, electrical uh, energy. Uh, is the carbon footprint of the cement used in the construction of a dam included in those <laughs> when, when looking at the life cycle of electricity? Um, probably not. 
Um, and uh, I, it's it's kind of a good question because uh, uh, cement is definitely a, a footprint. But yeah. the the impacts we do include land use change. Um, it is possible that the cement goes in, but you'd need to know for a specific dam how much cement and I, and what goes into the model right now is statistical information about, about um, the facilities that have been in place because we haven't built a new dam since Juanita when I was a kid. Um, and, um, oh, wait a minute, that's not quite true. Anyway, um, Site C is a whole new, um, a whole new picture. And um, what happens in the life cycle model is that you basically calculate that entire liability at the beginning, and then you amortize it over a period of time. And I use those terms because it's like a mortgage. So you pay the price to build the dam up front, but you account for it over a lifetime period. And um, I believe in the modeling, it's something like 30, it might even be as much as 100 years. Um, and over the amount of electricity, it still has a small impact. But um, whether that particular activity and, and that, you know, building a dam is counted, we'd have to dig into the model and, and go behind it. Um, but uh, it definitely is, like I say, you know, every year there's leaf mold and, and uh, bio mass dropping into reservoirs. That is accounted for um, based on scientific studies done on hydro dams, hydro reservoirs. So it's, it's close, it's probably closer than most, but it may not be everything. Okay, uh, so this, this is a follow-up for the uh, tractor question and Robbie uh, Hosgood asks, uh, uh, so Harbor Air electrified seaplanes could claim too? Uh, I'm uh, anybody who's getting ready for test flights, as soon as uh, um, Transport Canada would allow people on even for test flights, I'm, I'm good. I like the float planes and I'm comfortable with the idea that you'd have to glide in and get towed into harbor. But um, uh, no, but the reason is that the two fuel pools that we deal with, gasoline and diesel, um, the, the uh, planes fly on jet fuel, not gasoline or diesel. So when you electrify the harbor airplanes, you're displacing jet fuel. So the, the act doesn't recognize that. We are adding a jet fuel pool January 1st of next year. And then yes, they will be able to report their credits for the, for the charging. Um, BC Ferries also reports their electric charging, uh, not charging, but their shore power on the overnight when they started using shore power so they could shut down the diesel engine that keeps the literally the lights on and the, and the uh, passenger spaces warm. And um, we have got, we've got some tools under the act that we can help with these large activities. And uh, one of the um, projects that we're supporting is the installation of the charging infrastructure for those battery electric hybrid ferries that are coming into service, the ones that have, I think the last one is just arriving in Victoria. And um, when they're able to plug those in at the wharves and run the ferries on battery, they will be reporting those credits and using the value to keep the, keep the business model whole. Okay, we're, uh, we're gonna shut it down here in a few minutes. I'm just gonna ask a couple more. Um, this one came in early, uh, maybe before you describe some things, but maybe we could open this question up to give us an idea of how the metering will work in, in condos. So Glenn, Gary asks, with electricity as a fuel and chargers as FSE, do BC Hydro's home smart meters provide the ability to track EV charging? And maybe we could just talk about what does track EV charging in condos specifically. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I think probably hydro would need something that tells the difference between a dryer and a, and a Tesla. Um, but on one of the, one of the practical reasons that they're reporting residential charging is that they can detect the signature of uh, charging events on the large statistical scale. And so they are actually able to estimate electricity use for electric vehicle charging without intruding into the details of your electricity consumption.
basically from the you know tracking on an hourly basis your your electricity through the smart meter it would be more accurate to track it with a meter on the charger but like i say right now i'm not sure where they're at i know they're working with volunteers to uh test equipment and and uh you know the the impacts it could have and the benefits it might have because if you don't have that connection to the vehicle from the smart meter, you also can't do that kind of load management that says uh, we're having a, a you know, peak use of electricity and it would be nice if we weren't charging your car during the supper hour, but we'll make sure it's charged by 2 a.m. or whatever policy, computer policy they could have put in place. So they're definitely going to be moving towards that. I just suspect they're not there right now, except in test cases. Right. Uh, and certainly for the individual home, we're not applying anyway, because um, you have to be a five unit place. Yeah. And, and so we'll be working with Hydro to improve the metering. We're also going to be encouraging them um, through mechanisms under the act to say, you know, we'll accept the estimation methodologies, but we would like you to offer good services and, and so on. So there's going to be, uh, there is work underway about um, a level of accountability. This is not going to be an easy windfall for BC Hydro. They're, they're going to be um, subject to, uh, to some policy around, around this. And, and it'll, be, uh, it'll be the balance government wants to find between rates and electric vehicle adoption. More to come through policies over the next year. Okay. Uh, a question here from Maggie Bainham. Uh, she asks, uh, are credits validated as they're received or do you validate all credits after the March 31st uh, reporting deadline for sale after that? Um, they're validated when they're reported and the mandatory report is once a year at the March 31st deadline. There is a potential for quarterly reporting, but We've got some rules around that and some restriction because there's no um, compliance obligation at that point. Um, and, uh, and we have limited resources for all of this. So we probably would be looking at quarterly uh, validations for those with larger quantities and uh, you know, defer the smaller quantities for an annual validation. Okay. Uh, uh... A question from Stuart Forsyth. What is the plan to track tons of emissions from refinery stacks? Maybe a, like <laughs> you'll a have to go to uh, you'll have to go to the climate action uh, secretariat at the Ministry of Environment and and uh, Climate Solutions um, and take a look at the greenhouse gas industrial uh, control and reporting act or reporting and control act. We call it Gurkha. Um, there are plans. Um, they are in another ministry and another team. I know who they are and I know um, roughly what they do, but I don't know enough to comment. <laughs> okay, uh, okay uh, back more specifically to the, the five dwellings. Uh, Curtis Shepard asks, if a company owns more than five freehold dwellings, can it apply? I presume this means that it's not a, a single strata, but it's separate things all held by one company? Um, I think that's another one that we'd have to, we'd have to understand what the legal relation is. I suspect that if a, if a company owns five separate residential properties, those are five separate residential properties, not one. Because it's not about, it's not about the corporation or the ownership. It's about the building, the way the act is worded, with the way the regulations worded. So I guess I can't get together with my neighbor and make a little corporation to get my individual charger onto the plan here. Eh? No, I don't think, not unless you're going <laughs> to, unless you're going to share the property in a strata, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to finish with this uh, kind of double question from Lawrence uh, Garvin. Uh, uh, He's stressing that stratas and MERBs need to know immediately whether it's more economically advantageous. A lot of our, our, our condo owners are looking at this to put EVs, EVSEs on collective or individual meters as the ability to receive the credits totally changes the economic landscape 
of installing chargers. Yes, it does. A and people are, and then he stresses in a second question that this understanding must be had before designing, installing the system, which people system, are starting yeah. to do now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll take that in a way as a, as a comment. I, I kind of agree. Um, but that's the, the, you know, the policy is where it's at and, and uh, this is the amount of interpretation we're giving right now. The rest is up for people to uh, come to their own understandings and, and if there are further questions, we can answer them through the email. But, um, you know, we, we think that the, that the regulations are now really fair, really quite clear. And with the, with the uh, improvements that are coming on the, uh, the structure of the act and the wording and so on, this policy will not be changing. So um, there, there are, you know, there's now the opportunity to begin some business plans. The only thing that is not possible today that we are planning to bring in is the ability to assign the responsibility to someone else, an aggregator in the language of the, uh, of the flows and the charge points of the world. And um, that would then allow um, people who have one or two chargers to benefit from the reporting without the burden of reporting to get $1,000 a year. But you pay somebody else to do it, right? From our perspective, it then means we've got one entity to be accountable and uh, not however many clients that entity has. And we would deal with those details through an audit rather than a, than a direct report. But I think we've put all the pieces in place to understand the economics. Some of the slides that I, that I um, presented and, and I've given uh, John a copy so that it's, it's available. We're also gonna put it on our own website. Um, and, uh, you know, people can do their calculations and, uh, you know, if they think there's any doubt about the uh, understanding, they probably either can ask us if we can give a stronger answer, we will. But the, uh, the next point is um, if people need some legal advice to get counsel to help them understand. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we will be putting more information online and, and uh, clarifying this. The registration system for the individual chargers is there. Um, and, uh, and we'll be putting more informational material as we learn what questions people have that, you know, the frequently asked questions uh, trope, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start answering those frequently answered questions and have frequently asked questions and getting those answers online for everybody to see. Okay, I'm going to close with one last question, which frankly, I don't understand quite what it's addressing, but I hope uh, from your position, you'll understand this very clearly. Uh, it's from Kelly Carmichael. He asks, any automated process being discussed for EV service providers? I'm not quite sure what that might means, because it might be a few things, but let me... Um... EV service provider. So if it is a charging company, say a, a charge point or a flow or whatever it is, that is reporting to us, service provider, um, we have an online, uh, we have an online reporting system. So it's all electronic. It's got uh, spreadsheet interfaces. It takes a company like Imperial Oil about 20 minutes to upload everything, everything in their compliance report to us. So we've definitely got an automated system if that's the system he's asking about. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, I, I think we'll, we'll stop there. And John, do you want to... Uh, thank you, Don, uh, for uh, handling the questions. And, and to Michael, thank you very much for uh, spending some time with us uh, this evening. I'd just like to point out how proud we are as British Columbians uh, to have such a progressive government, you know, uh, leading the low carbon fuel standard um, 12 years ago uh, is a major step. You know, the rest of Canada is still looking our way. Yeah. And um, I wanted to thank you for your leadership in helping the rest of Canada and the federal thank government yeah. uh, get, get to where we are now. Uh, I know um, as a chartered accountant, the significance, the financial significance of this, it is going to be substantial and uh, it will make a big difference in uh, 
our biggest roadblock to uh, EV adoption. Um, and that is all the people that live in condos uh, and legacy condos that were built before 2011 and most yeah. recently that don't have, um, you know, all those, what we call legacy condos. It's a, it's a big area and being able to reduce the demand for uh, gasoline and diesel right now is the fastest way we can get to uh, mitigating um, our use of carbon fuels. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so thank you again for your time. I'd like to thank uh, your department and, and the government generally for, for, for really being progressive. We are very I, lucky in British Columbia to have uh, such a progressive government and, and yeah. top leading um, uh, officials. One, one observation on that, we brought the act in under the Gordon Campbell government um, so it has been enforced through um, effectively now uh, three different governance, two different parties. So this act has been supported by both parties in the legislature. And that's an interesting thing because it is challenging. Uh, it is challenging for the suppliers. It is challenging for governance and for understanding. And yet it's managed to uh, stay as a leading policy um, that hasn't been impacted by um, party philosophies or party policies. It, it's recognized as something that is working for greenhouse gas reductions. Yes, and this I think is one of the few, one of the few policies where, where actual uh, uh, you know, penalties or, or charges that are charged to the oil and gas industry are actually directly being used to, to actually make things better. Yeah. There's very few. I mean, most, most things go into general revenue and we know where that doesn't go. So, <laughs> so yes. Uh, anyway, keep indicating that support to your MLAs and so on, because this is, this is something that even after 12 years is, it's news to many people that we have this. There are varying perspectives on this, uh, depending on the impact it has on people in a given day. And there is still, you know, it's, it's beginning a transformation and it, that makes a lot of people nervous. So I would say it's still not a background foundational piece from that sense. It's still at risk of misunderstanding and, uh, and needs to be... Um, well, it needs to be managed carefully and it needs to be showing benefits in the right areas. And uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that we've been able to do that so far and we plan to continue. Well, thank you again for your presentation tonight. It was very illuminating and it was great to hear from someone who really understands uh, the details, the minutia of, of, the, of the policies. And uh, um, thank you again. So, yeah, uh, so that will wrap up our uh, uh, presentation for tonight. Thank you all for attending. We had a record turnout. We're very pleased with it. Uh, check in on our website, viva.ca, for uh, if you want to follow up on any of the information sent here tonight. And, and any questions, and take our, use our email address. Absolutely. And that'll all be on our site. So uh, you'll be able to go there or, or to the um, uh, Emily's uh, website yeah. uh, on the BC government. Okay. Thanks for Perfect. inviting me. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.